creating an agentless host intrusion detection system using PowerShell and WMI. So uh, what do I mean by agentless? Uh, I mean we're not actually installing any software on, on our targets. We're using uh, effectively permanent WMI event subscriptions um, to trigger off certain events and then to use built-in classes within WMI to respond to those events accordingly. All without dropping any uh, MSIs, EXEs, DLLs, drivers to disk. A little bit about myself. Uh, there's my Twitter handle. Um, right now I'm the uh, R&D capability lead with the uh, Bears Group Adaptive Threat Division. Uh, previously I was on the uh, FireEye Flare team doing malware reversing. Uh, and then before that I, I did some uh, red teaming on a, on a government red team. Uh, prior to that I was uh, enlisted Navy as a, as a Chinese linguist. Uh, I'm a CDM MVP, although uh, with my specialty obviously being in PowerShell, although I wouldn't really call myself a cloud or data center expert, so it is what it is. Uh, I'm also the creator of PowerSploit and PowerShell Arsenal. I've also got various other uh, modules and repositories on, on GitHub that you're welcome to check out under uh, manifestation. Cool, and I'm Jared Atkinson. I'm the Hunt technical lead. I just got a new job at Veris Group uh, in the Adaptive Threat Division as well. Former, I was in the US Air Force on the Hunt team. Uh, I mentioned on Monday, I was the 2015 Black Hat Minesweeper champion. So before PowerShell, there was Minesweeper and I was obsessive compulsive with that as well. Um, I'm the moderator of the PowerShell.com security forum, which if you have PowerShell security questions, please come ask them and we'll try to help you out. And then I develop uh, Power Forensics, WMI Event, and Uproot IDS, which the last two we will be talking about today. All right, so uh, generally, what is Uproot? I'm kind of setting the stage. Uproot is a host-based intrusion detection system built on permanent WMI event subscriptions. So um, permanent WMI event subscriptions allow you to monitor for changes in the operating system, and why not monitor for activities that may be associated with an intrusion? That was kind of the thought process. Um, and it leverages this WMI event module to easily manage subscriptions. What is WMI event, you might ask? Well, it's a PowerShell module that abstracts the complexities of permanent WMI event subscriptions. So um, WMI event subscriptions, there's a lot of background knowledge that you need to have in order to get them working. And so uh, WMI event is trying to kind of bridge that gap for kind of a new, a new user of WMI event subscriptions to be able to easily create and you know, modify these subscriptions. It's a CDXML module, right? Uh, the base is built on CDXML, yes. Yeah. Okay, so a little motivation behind our, our work here. Um, in my previous job, we were investigating um, the group known as APT29, and some of their, um, their te the techniques and tools that they used involved using permanent WMI event subscriptions, both as a persistence mechanism, right, so their code would execute uh, after boot every time, um, and also as like a covert storage mechanism. So they were using the WMI repository itself as a means of storing their payloads. Uh, and what that enabled them to do was um, both store their payloads, uh, perform persistence, and also execute those payloads entirely remotely using nothing but WMI, which is pretty cool. Um, so a buddy of mine during our, um, our holiday party was asking me because that they were, um, I mean, they, they were kind of down in the weeds investigating this really extensive breach that had occurred. And um, he, he was already pretty experienced with uh, WMI permanent event subscriptions. But he was kind of curious. Like, so he asked me, how would you go about detecting the like, WMI persistence, right? So in other words, um, the creation of permanent WMI event subscriptions. So I started thinking, and actually it, it occurred to me, like, you could use you create a permanent WMI event subscription to detect the creation of permanent WMI event subscriptions. So that's what kind of led me down this path so to think that there's like, there's all these built-in WMI methods, or sorry, uh, WMI uh, events and classes that you could potentially trigger off of to detect all kinds of malicious actions. Yep. And so the, it was actually kind of an interesting concept because uh, before Matt and I actually knew each other, we both came up with the idea of using permanent WMI event subscriptions as an IDS uh, completely on our own and then like the genesis of our relationship I guess was talking about this concept so that's pretty neat. Um, the reason why I kind of came about it was I was in the Air Force and as you can imagine the DOD 
in general is very uh, specific on what type of software can be added to their systems and there's a very long change process and so um, we, were, we were often running into uh, issues with being able to push out continuous monitoring applications and so um, one of the reasons why I got interested in PowerShell is if you could script it, then it's not considered a software change, and so you could literally script anything. And so, uh, so the idea was to create a continuous monitoring capability uh, that leveraged WMI and PowerShell as a mechanism um, to monitor for adversary intrusions. And now as a consultant, I still have that same kind of idea, right? So as a consultant, I can't go into a Fortune 100 company and say, hey guys, you're just going to randomly deploy this software that I'm giving you. Um, we could just go in and make changes to configuration as opposed to uh, actual changes in software deployment. So. And the great thing about WMI is that it's been present on every version of Windows going back to like Windows 98. So theoretically, you could use like, say, the, the V3 SIM commandlets to administer a Windows 98 box. Although I think you'd have to install WMI. I think by default uh, it comes installed like Windows XP and above. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I, I actually use the SIM commandlets very often to uh, to do WMI tasks in Windows as in Windows XP where PowerShell isn't even installed. So it's great. Um, so if you have a capability like this, then all you need is like your host machine with PowerShell on it. Uh, to run like these WMI or SIM commandlets onto and install these like these signatures on remote systems, all without needing to have PowerShell on any of them, just the WMI service listening. All right, so a quick refresher into uh, WMI eventing. Uh, there's really like two event classes. There's extrinsic and intrinsic classes. Extrinsic are my favorite uh, because they trigger immediately. All right, so. Um, if you've worked with WMI events before, you may have noticed that sometimes you need to add like a polling interval. Uh, so that's a requirement of intrinsic events. You don't need those with extrinsic, although you're not getting quite the flexibility per se for extrinsic events just because there's not as many available. Whereas you can get really creative with intrinsic events. Um, I, I always prefer to go to extrinsic first because I know they will fire. Whereas with an intrinsic event, say you wanted to trigger off of process creation. So if you had like an instance creation event um, that triggered upon the creation of a Win32 process uh, class instance, there's a chance that you might miss that within that polling interval if that process started and stopped within that polling interval time frame. So that's why I'm always hesitant to use those, but if I have to, then I have to um, because the, I mean, the, there's not an extrinsic event for every conceivable event in existence. So a good example of an extrinsic event would be like the registry key change event. Uh, so you, like you would specify the, uh, the hive and the registry key, and then if there's any change within that uh, immediate key, so like it, it doesn't work recursively, uh, it, it would trigger. And then like I said, like with the instance creation event as an intrinsic event, you'd have to specify that polling interval, uh, but you can get super creative. So right, there's thousands of these WMI classes built in by default in the WMI repo. So really just like use your creativity to think about uh, the possible events that you might be able to trigger off of using intrinsic events. All right, there's, uh, there's using PowerShell, there's really like two ways to register uh, WMI events. The first would be local events. So using the older uh, WMI commandlets, uh, you would use a registered WMI event. And then uh, the, the newer SIM commandlets available in V3 and above, uh, you would use register SIM indication event. And most of the examples that I'll be showing you today will be using those SIM commandlets. And the great thing about the SIM commandlets, at least from my perspective, is that uh, they make deployment of these WMI events and signatures so much easier because they give you the flexibility of being able to use either WinRM as a transport or legacy DCOM, right? So if I wanted to use the SIM commandlets to deploy signatures to Windows XP, I would just specify as a SIM session option to use the DCOM protocol. And then there's permanent WMI events. So what you need to use for the older commandlets would be set WMI instance to create new instance of a set of classes I'll show you. Uh, otherwise, using the SIM commandlets, you would use new SIM instance. Uh, with the SIM commandlets, there's also a set SIM instance, so it's a, it's a little confusing, uh, but actually it makes more sense with the SIM stuff. Set SIM instance will set the properties on an existing uh, 
on an existing object, whereas new sim instance will instantiate a new uh, WMI object. Whereas set WMI instance kind of does double duty doing both. Okay, so in order to set a permanent WMI event, you need the following. You need an instance of an event consumer class, and there are five standard event consumer classes I'll cover briefly. So the event consumer class, sorry, that should just be event consumer. Um, this is the action that you want to perform upon your event filter triggering. So the event filter is comprised of just a WQL uh, event query. And I'll show you some, example, some examples of those. And then to install the permanent WMI event, you just bind the filter and consumer together using an instance of a filter to consumer binding. All right, so let me run through a few examples here. So some intrinsic events. Can anyone tell me what this is interested in, in catching? I mean, it should be self-explanatory, I guess. Yeah, so uh, this will trigger any time a service changes into the running state. So I emphasize changes uh, by using the instance modification <coughs> event class. Now, if you were interested in a new service being created, then you could create a query using instance creation event where target instance is a Win32 service. In this case, the polling interval is five seconds. That's set within five. Yep. So if for whatever reason this service went from a running back to a stop state, uh, there may be an instance where you wouldn't catch that, although I think in this case you probably would. But again, intrinsic events can be kind of tricky um, with those polling intervals. All right, this one I really like. I love the Win32 startup command from a defensive perspective. It's great. So uh, this will just monitor for any instances of new Win32 startup command uh, classes. So what this class is, is it covers uh, all user and system run, <coughs> uh, run keys and user and system start menu items. So I don't know if Microsoft had the intent that this would, that this would be great for defensive purposes for catching attacker persistence actions, um, but that's what we love to, to use it for. All right, some extrinsic events. Uh, this one's kind of cool. I'll be demo demoing it shortly. Uh, this has nothing to do with the like volume on your speakers, rather uh, like disk volumes. So what I'll show you is uh, I'll trigger an event upon inserting removable media into my laptop. What, what's event type two? Uh, so I have it pulled up here. Event type, the question was what is event type two? So I just pulled up Win32 volume change event in MSDN and event type two is device arrival. So insertion of uh, removable media or any, any fixed or removable media. Okay. How does that compare like if I were to dock my laptop on my docking station, would that detect all the USB based devices that are already plugged into that dock? So the question was would this extrinsic event trigger off of um, say like you attach your laptop to a docking station, uh, would it trigger for all of the new devices that were attached thereafter? Uh, the answer is probably no, uh, unless you had like some, like a, a removable drive plugged into the, the USB port on there. Um, I think if it gets registered as a logical volume, so it, like it gets a drive letter per se, yep. um, then it will be registered regardless of how it's attached. All of the other like devices that are registered would be um, registered as like a plug and play device, and there are WMI classes for plug and play stuff. So you could certainly trigger off like new new device creation and whatnot. Again, you can be very creative with this stuff, and there's a huge WMI repository at at, at your your fingertips to to create some of these cool uh, uh, event filters. Okay, and the last one is Win32 process start trait. Start trace. I really like this one again because it triggers immediately. So, say I was interested anytime Chrome started up, I would be notified immediately with with this uh, event. Okay. So the event consumers. You have five built-in event consumers provided by Microsoft. Thank you. So uh, one is log file event consumer. So upon an an event filter triggering, 
write some data to a file, and you can actually pass the arguments provided from the event filter to these event consumers. So you can have like contextual data provided to the event consumers that you would likely want. So like in, in the case here of the uh, process start trace, if you wanted to log the name of the process and the process ID to the log file, you'd be able to do that. ActiveScript event consumer. Uh, this allows you to execute any uh, WSH uh, scripting language. So that includes VBScript and JScript. Sorry, no PowerShell. Um, so Jared's going to show you a case where he uses this to make a call to make uh, an HTTP GET request out to like a SIM and report some um, like security related information. It's for the people that like paying the ActiveScript event consumer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, attackers really like ActiveScript event consumer too. Uh, they also really enjoy the command line event consumer. So say you have PowerShell present on the operating system and then you have some interesting um, like attacker created event filter and then once that triggers it would say execute something like powershell.exe dash encoded command and then some base64 encoded super evil thing. Uh, there's anti event log event consumer so it creates an event log entry and I really like this one because the event log already captures so much like security related stuff anyway but what permanent WMI events allow you to do is supplement the event log. For everything that the event log doesn't capture, say like the creation of permanent WMI uh, events, you would be able to write those actions to the event log because those would otherwise never be detected. And then SMTP event consumer, shoot out an email if some, if some uh, event occurs. Yeah, don't do that when you're like monitoring process creation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and as I kind of go through the methodology that we have for creating these signatures, or really when I refer to a signature, I'm referring to uh, a, a WQL event query. Um, you'll want to be very targeted in how you uh, create your, your filters so that they're not firing all the time or that they're extremely high fidelity such that they only trigger when you know that something really, really bad is happening. Okay. So as you start thinking about what events you might want to create, think about the following things, right? So let's say you want to uh, start listing out the things that you'd like to detect. So service creation, registry persistence. Remember I showed you the Win32 startup command class. That's a great one. Lateral movement. I'm going to be using this one as an example in a little bit. WMI persistence. Again, we already kind of talked about that. And so go down your list, start writing out what you'd like to detect. Um, and then start digging through the WMI repository and see what classes might be able to, to match up the action that you want to detect to what's in the WMI repository. Um, but before you go down that road, just consider that there might be other detection mechanisms already present. So like, I, I think it's in like Windows 7 and above, I forget what it was backported to, but you can enable process auditing anyway, so that's all gonna go to the event log anyway, so you may not need to use WMI for process auditing, but you could. Uh, and then command line auditing, uh, you know, like app locker. Uh, you can put app locker into audit mode, like if you wanted to track all, um, all modules being loaded, like all device drivers, executables, and DLLs that are being loaded. That would already be logged to the event log if you have app locker in enforce or audit mode. So consider other options first is what I'm saying. Now, if you've determined that you really do want to use uh, permanent WMI events, consider the following. Go through and discover all of the extrinsic events that exist first, because again, those are, those are ideal. They will trigger immediately. And if not, then fall back to intrinsic events. And just be mindful of like the polling interval and whether or not you uh, will miss events from firing. Okay. Now, um, how would you actually go about determining what classes are available? Well, we have PowerShell for that. Uh, and then the, in the latter, latter portion of my demo, I'll also be showing you how I test out my events using Wibum Test, a super old school tool with a terrible UI, but it's, it's extremely useful. It just gets the job done. All right, so here's my, my first example. I'm just showing you um, 
a local event subscription using register sim indication event. And what I'm interested in is anytime a new volume is attached to my computer. So by attached, I mean event type two, and you'd have to look that up in the documentation. And the action that it will perform upon that uh, event firing is it will just print out the, the drive name. Okay. And to register all these events, like well, especially permanent WMI events, you'll have to run from an elevated prompt. Okay. I got my handy dandy Sapien USB key here, so let's see if this fires. Yep. Cool. And now when I remove it, it shouldn't trigger anything because uh, I've I've kind of filtered down on, on the uh, event fil filter a little bit, so where it will only trigger upon insertion. Okay. All right. Going on, uh, here is an example of how you do a permanent WMI event subscription. So here are so what I want. Here's what I want to trigger off of. It's the same query as before. And then the uh, event consumer that I want to use is I want to execute PowerShell. All right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the drive, the drive name here. And this is how you specify it. So uh, you're passing uh, an instance of this class is being passed to the event consumer. And here I'm specifying one of the properties of that class, the drive name. And uh, I'm doing something a little shady here. I'm base64 decoding the EI car string, which is like a test string for AV. So as soon as this drops to disk, in theory, AV should detect it right away. So I'm going to drop it to my USB stick without any user interaction. Okay. So just imagine that you know this would be something like actually malicious that would infect this USB stick that I'm going to insert. One thing that we didn't really touch on is that those local WMI events are only uh, persistent within, uh, I guess, the run space or within that shell. And so once you close PowerShell, uh, once you close PowerShell out, those local WMI events are going to just disappear. And so that's why the permanent WMI events, they're going to last through reboots. They're just going to be there until you get rid of them. And so that's why we're going that direction. Yay, demo fail. Clarify. You said the intrinsic are volatile? No, the local. So when you use register WMI event. I'm just trying to think of how I could use this with some different Yeah, no problem. Okay. All right. Are we ready? So um, look in the bottom right of the screen, and hopefully uh, when eicar.txt drops, Defender will catch it. Okay, well, it, it should have popped up, but it did actually catch it. So it won't even let me open the file because it, it's quarantined. So, yeah, <laughs> good job, Defender. <laughs> you catch the obvious. <laughs> okay, now um, I, I want to show you how I would go about um, developing these signatures. So I wrote some helper functions to say, I, I want to list out all of the extrinsic events within every namespace in the WMI repo. And so I would literally just start going through these one by one and see if anything sticks out to me. And there was one that stood out to me in the root simb2 namespace, which was uh, this WIMI provider exec method async event. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of this. But um, I will show you WIBM Wibben test and just show you that sort of my, my testing methodology here. So I'll connect to the root simb2 namespace, enter a notification query. And so say I'm not quite sure what is going to fire in here, but we'll just, we'll just see what pops up. So I suspect that if I execute any WIMI method, that some instances would, would pop up that I, that I might be able to get some interesting information from. So I'll call the uh, Win32 process create method, and also I'll pull um, a value from the registry using the std rod, uh, std rich prov uh, class. 
and let's see if we get some stuff that pops up. Okay. Okay, so we got two things here. Now I can double click on one. There, there's a little bit of lag time between when you click on it and when you get this pop up. I'm gonna hide these system properties so I can see the actual properties of, of the class here. And what happened was, so here are some of the interesting properties. So I was notified that the create method within the Win32 process class within the root mb 2 namespace was executed. And what I found to be really cool was that it provides input parameters to that method within this embedded object. So I can view that embedded object and now I get the raw command line of what was executed. So here's like ghetto but super effective command line auditing built into Windows. Okay, it's pretty cool. One thing that we didn't mention also is that uh, the create method for the Win32 process WMI class is one of the top uh, lateral movement techniques that are used uh, by attackers. And so yep. uh, very frequently to get code execution on a remote system, they will leverage that method. And so that's why detecting it is pretty cool. Can you explain what is a lateral movement? Lateral movement is uh, if I'm an attacker and let's say I, I am able to fish somebody and get access to their system, um, I want to start spreading throughout the network to start enumerating and maybe get figure out where a domain admin is logged in so I can steal their credentials. Um, in order to get access to their system, I need some way to execute code on that system. And so uh, that, is, that process is called lateral movement. So once you've grown accustomed to uh, like rooting out these uh, like defensive signatures, here's some examples of what might be useful to defenders. So we just saw the first one here. Uh, although I'm going to filter it further. So this is what would detect that lateral movement that Jared was talking about. I'm interested in all method invocations uh, of the, the create method within the Win32 process. So that'll give me the command line context of what was executed via WMine. All right. Uh, here, if I was interested in any like remote WIMI registry actions, this is what would trigger. Trigger that. Now. Here, I could do a Win32 process start trace on PowerShell.exe, but I was, uh, I was just saying to a gentleman up here, PowerShell is not PowerShell.exe. PowerShell could run in the context of any arbitrary process without it being PowerShell.exe. So this is the detection that, the signature that I came up with. So anytime a module is loaded, so a module being an exe DLL device driver, uh, whose name contains system.management.automation.dll or .ni, which stands for native image, .dll, then let me know. Because um, maybe in our enterprise, like we don't have admins running PowerShell everywhere. So on those hosts where PowerShell should not be expected to run all the time, maybe I, I, I would want to be alerted upon that happening. Or if PowerShell is running in svchost.exe, then yep. you probably definitely want to be, no, be <laughs> notified about that. Yep. Um, when I was talking about what APT29 was doing, using WMI as a covert storage mechanism, they were creating their own custom classes. Here's a signature that you could use to detect that. Now, uh, you would eventually get some false positives, say like you installed the latest service pack of Windows where there's gonna be a lot of new WMI classes anyway, but hopefully you know, you'd be able to filter through those anyway because you're tracking when you're deploying updates. Lastly, uh, th this one's kind of interesting. If you're interested in maybe the attacker doing um, process enumeration using WMI, you would be able to detect that using this signature right here. So, yes. Uh, it, so I wouldn't consider this last event to be super important, um, but say your, uh, your like threat intel has indicated that within your industry vertical, attackers really enjoy doing process enumeration using WMI. So th this would be able to detect that action. So uh, just by the nature of the attacker running, say, get WIMI object win32 process, this would trigger 
or if they use wimic.exe to do the same thing, it would also trigger, and then you could be alerted. And so, from like a from an auditing perspective, being able to know that somebody what specifically somebody is using WMI for is very important. So, like typically, you'll see like WMI PRVSE.exe running when somebody's using WMI, um, but you won't actually know what class they're enumerating or what method they're calling. Um, in this case, it would let you specifically um, determine what method or class is being utilized or enumerated. Uh, so that would depend. The utility of that would depend on the method that the attacker happens to use or use frequently. Sure. I mean, you could make a very generic uh, subscription, and you would catch everything, but uh, probably not necessarily. What you yeah, would. you don't want these signatures to be super loud. Again, you should uh, filter as much as you possibly can. Oh, let me set this to so while Jared is setting up his portion of the demos, are, are there any questions that you have? What's the performance impact? So the, the comment was uh, related to performance impact. So that, that's not something that we've uh, like definitively quantified in our testing. Um, all we have are like the qualitative results of the fact that, so Jared has deployed how many uh, root signatures in a large environment? Yeah, so the, we have a client that is a Fortune 100 company that has uh, 60,000 Windows endpoints domestically and we deployed uh, root to those. And so, um, and generally uh, the, we, we did some performance testing kind of like, you know, looking at the system that it was deployed to. Uh, let's say we had 16 signatures deployed out um, and there was very minimal change from before to after. Like literally, we're talking like 0.1 meg of RAM being used and the processor doesn't even spike at all. And so, um, I don't know a like specific, like we haven't done tons and tons of testing on performance, but from just like looking at it and kind of playing around with it, we haven't seen any performance. I can't tell you one class to be extremely careful with <laughs> yes. is SIM data file. <laughs> so. <laughs> you, you will experience a performance hit with doing queries related to that unless it's an extremely specific event filter that you're using. All right, so uh, building on Matt's uh, use case for that lateral movement detection, he showed how we've used uh, WebM tests in order to kind of detect what's going on uh, for method calls. Um, we want to go ahead and probably create a w permanent WMI event subscription, and so the way that we would do that by hand, kind of the, like the old school way, I guess, um, is that we would have to go onto MSDN, figure out what the properties that are associated with an event filter class uh, are, and then we would by hand create our event filter, right? And so uh, in this case, I'm using uh, a property hash table um, in order to allow me to pass arguments to the Newsom instance uh, commandlet. And so in this case, we have a, a name, which is ext process create method. ext stands for extrinsic. Uh, we want the event namespace to be simv2, and then this is our query, the same query that Matt was showing, where we're looking for uh, Win32 process, and the method name over here is going to be create. And then the query language uh, in this case, and most cases, is WQL, WMI query, query language. Um, and then we're able to store that filter once it's created um, in the filter variable. All right, so that's been created. Um, next, we'll go, in this case, we want to write uh, events to the event log. Uh, that's the ideal situation because uh, you have things like Windows event forwarding to be able to centralize your event log. And so um, why do some kind of like, you know, uh, duct tape solution when you can just write to the Windows event log, which is support, the supported logging mechanism for the operating system. And so uh, what, what we're doing here is we have an array uh, called the template, template array, um, and that's going to have the actual data that will be written into the event log. And so in this case, we want to have an alert that says lateral movement detected, and then we want to store, um, like, hey, the namespace, the object path, the method name, and the command executed. And then we, we have the actual properties that the NT event log event consumer class need or needs. And uh, in this case, uh, we found that the WSH uh, event log uh, source is the best one. And if you use event, log, event ID 8 in particular, you can write arbitrary data to the event log. So there's that's like the one event ID in a source that just allows you to write whatever you want. And so Matt, I don't know how you figured that out, but. I was really confused by that. I never really knew how like event <laughs> sources worked under the hood. And I had a buddy who's really good at forensics who kind of dug into that and explained it to me. So the event ID refers to a specific like template string entry within that event source. So that event source corresponds to 
Uh, it's usually like a resource only DLL that uh, within one of its resources is just a huge array of these template strings. And in WSH, uh, like the eighth string is just basically like a percent %s format string, which allows you to write any data that you want using that source and event ID. So th that had been documented on the internet, like this is what you would use to write arbitrary data to the event log, but it was never explained why, so that's why. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, while he was doing that, I basically showed the contents of the filter and consumer variables just to show that this is an instance of a filter, event filter class, and this is an instance of an empty event log uh, event class. Empty log event, I don't know, I can't think of it off the top of my head. I'm now confused. Okay, and then what we need to do is we need to create the filter to consumer binding, and we're going to pass a reference to the filter and a reference to the consumer. And so, all right. And so, voila, now we have a filter to consumer binding or a permanent WMI event subscription is the term that we're using for that. Okay, so now what we should be able to do is uh, call the Win32 process create method and we should uh, get a, an event that's written to the Windows event log. And so we're going to try that. You know, fingers crossed this is giving me some problems a couple times, but and it's a live demo. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to read from the Windows event log that using the source WSH looking for a message of lateral movement detected. There should be a couple examples because I've practiced this recently. Um, but here is that command.exe. And so um, in general, what we could do is get event log to kind of show that I didn't have those pre-staged um, or log name app, application source WSH and then we can do what is it newest yeah. one and so that just got written at 1834 and it's 1835 on this system so uh, just showing that that actually did in fact write to the event log just now all right, so we have now detected a, probably the most common uh, lateral movement technique uh, out there. Obviously, there's tons of lateral movement techniques, and so this is just one of them, but it's a really good start, and there's not a detection mechanism for that that I'm aware of in public. So, exactly. all right, so we're going to move on. All right, so that was kind of kind of painful, right? In, in theory, I would have been going back and forth to MSDN to figure out the different properties and things of that nature. Um, so we wrote the uh, WMI event module in order to kind of simplify this and abstract out some of the complexities. And so um, we have things like new WMI event filter, new WMI event consumer, uh, new NT event log event consumer to be more specific, new WMI event subscription. So let's, let's take a look at this. It's also worth mentioning that Trevor Sullivan wrote the power event yep. or power events module a long time ago, and um, that that's also a great utility. He also has uh, an extremely useful uh, white paper that shows you like how to register these things, how to use WIPM test, and use those notification queries for testing your events. So that's highly recommended as well. All right. So what I'm doing now? Oh. Um, Jared, is your help broken or is it just empty? It's just empty. Don't touch me. <laughs> 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 Okay. Yeah, no, it's just it's just empty. Um, Classic just blunder. I know, Josh. Oh, <laughs> June, I have another uh, module that I would yeah, like your help on. Um, so, so yeah, what, what I was trying to show before I got in trouble was um, was that now what we have is we have the new WMI event filter, and there's a specific parameter for every uh, property that you're going to need to pass to it, right? So in this case, it needs a name, a, an event namespace, a query, and a query language. So just kind of typing those out. Uh, in 32 process start trace. So this is going to basically capture every time a process is, is started. And we've kind of gone away for this example from trying to do something fancy just to try and do something that we could trigger very easily. Um, and so WQL will fill in automatically. There's that filter. It's called test filter in this case. Um, so then if we do help get, this is a fun one. So, whoops, not get, sorry, yeah. new. All right, so new WMI event consumer, like we said, there's five different types of event consumers that you can create. And within each, e or different event consumers, there are multiple ways to call them. And so there's like 37 million uh, parameter sets in this situation. And so you can filter through these and try to determine what you want to do. 
In this case, we know that we want to use the NT event log event consumer, so we can do new NT event log event consumer. Oops, oops, that's not what we want. Does anyone else know the pain of parameter set combinatorial explosion? <laughs> yeah, I, that, that command or that function has, uh, I think, like 400 lines of parameters. So, yeah, that was a pain. Um, and so in this case, NT event log has two different ways that you can use it. Um, the first example is if you want to do it locally or use uh, the computer name variable um, or parameter. Um, if, you, if you want to use a sim session in order to push it out to a remote system over sim, then you can use the second parameter set. And so in this example, we want to use a name, a category, an event ID, an event type, um, insertion strings, which are what we want to actually write to the uh, event log, and then the number of insertion strings and the source name. Right. So that's a lot of stuff that we would have to remember if this didn't tell us, so. Oh, not my. Okay, so name, we're gonna call it test consumer, uh, category, we'll say zero, <coughs> event ID. The things that actually matter in this case are the event ID has to be eight, and then uh, event type, we'll say two, I think is warning. Um, insertion string templates, I'm just going to write, uh, what did I do? Process name, so we're going to say process name started. And so that should be written to the event log. Um, let's see what else we need here. Source name, yeah, WSH, and then number of insertion strings is one. So I just ran that. Now I have a test consumer, which is going to write process name has started um, to the event log. And then, uh, whoops, then what we can do is Description. And this tells us how we're going to do this, uh, how we're going to create a binding. Uh, I've just kind of renamed it as subscription because that makes a little more sense. Um, and so we can do, do new WMI event subscription. We're going to give it a filter name, test filter, consumer name, or consumer type. It's an NT event log event consumer, consumer name, and it's going to be test consumer. And so there it is. Now, now the uh, subscription has been created. So let's go back. Well, actually, we just start a random process. Okay, so calc has been created. So now we can do oops, event log application. It's not a security related talk if calc isn't popping. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Source WSH. And so there you see in the message calc.exe started. So now we're monitoring for process creation. Um, process creation is obviously going to be a very loud signature. Um, so you just kind of got to take that for what that is. Let me go back here and kind of clear everything out. Okay, um, so that, that is the generic WMI event module. Um, obviously, you don't necessarily, for more complicated filters and things of that nature, you don't necessarily want to remember all of that. And so we've uh, kind of made a mechanism for storing your, uh, your filters and consumers and things of that nature. And so in this case, we basically take that hash table and we store it in a, in a file. Um, and then we dot source it. So now, once we dot source it, dollar props represents what's in that file. Um, there, the caveat here is that you should, before you dot source a file, you should probably know what's actually in that file because you're running arbitrary code. Um, so yesterday, the PowerShell team talked about how they're coming out with a way to like signature an entire module. That would be a very good use use case here. Is that you're signaturing that none of the filters have been uh, changed, basically, or none of the filters are consumers. All right, so uh, then what we can do is we can just splat props. And so, and so now we've created that filter. So we're kind of trying to t make this a little bit easier. So um, Upward has a bunch of these built-in signatures in the form yeah. of a hash table, which is then splatted to the yep. functions that you just showed you. And so everything is known as props in the way that we've done it so far. So now I just create an event filter with significantly less typing. And, uh, and then we're going to, actually, let's just copy this entire thing. And we'll run that, and now we've created the consumer. And so what this consumer is doing in particular is we're monitoring for startup, uh, startup command creation. So this is an intrinsic event. Um, I believe right now it's uh, pulling within 10, so every 10 seconds it's going to pull and look for a new uh, startup command. And one of the reasons why 10 is OK is because if it's a persistence mechanism, then it's probably going to be there for longer than 10 minutes, if that's what we're worried about. And so now we can uh, go ahead and create a value in the run key. 
And so we're going to create a value uh, called Jared with a, an argument of cmd.exe. So every, uh, as soon as uh, the system rebooted, or in the case of the system starting up again, uh, a command shell will be popped. And so um, I don't know if that's super cool, but it, we'll get the point across. And so that, that was created. And now we can check to see that it wrote. And as you can see, I've practiced this a few times before we did this. But in general, uh, it writes out to the event log and says, hey, an auto run entry was added. So now we're able to monitor for you know, process starts, for uh, lateral movement, for registry, um, auto run additions. But uh, what, if, what if you don't have like Windows Event Forwarding working, or you're a consultant like me, and the company that you're consulting for doesn't have the time to set up Windows Event Forwarding? Right? Uh, what we did is we decided to make this uh, what I call the uh, Active Script Generic HTTP uh, consumer. And so, as you can see, lots of fun VB script. I never knew that to escape a quote, you had to use three quotes. Or there's some weird thing like that, <laughs> I have no idea. But, um, but generally what we're doing is we're using, uh, we're basically creating an instance of the Microsoft XML HTTP uh, com object, and then we're using that to uh, basically post um, data to a specific uh, listening post, or uh, sim in some cases. So we've got it working definitely with Splunk, uh, Elk or Logstash, um, and we've got it working with uh, QRadar, which is, I think, uh, I don't know who makes that, IBM, I think. And so what, what we're doing is we're taking that target event, and the reason why it's generic is in, this works with literally any WMI, well, not every WMI, but all the ones that I've tested it works with, um, and it will basically uh, create a JSON representation of that object and then post it out to your sim, which is most sims are going to have some sort of REST uh, ingestion, REST API ingestion. And then uh, basically we create the active script event consumer with that script and tell it we want to use VB script as the scripting engine. So going back. Is there a reason you're not using like invoke web requests or anything like that? Because we're not relying upon PowerShell whatsoever. Got it. Thank you. There's no reason you yeah, could. So, yeah. Yeah. so we want to avoid the like startup of processes um, and because like PowerShell startup is a relatively uh, expensive process when you're talking about monitoring every process creation. And it will also create every like, yeah, uh, infinite loop. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a filter real quick. This is a process start trace filter. Um, then we're going to create this active script event consumer. And it's going to ask me my IP. So I'm just going to do it to localhost, because why not? And so now you see like the IP was filled in. It's pretty, that's pretty nifty. Um, and then we're going to create a subscription that binds those two together. So AS generic HTTP process start trace. Um, next, what I want to do, so right now I am literally every process that's created, I'm sending out an HTTP post request to my local host. Um, this is really small, can you, can you guys actually see this? Yes. Okay. It's not like the details of what I'm about to do aren't, uh, what is it called, PowerCat? So uh, a buddy of mine wrote PowerCat, which is a Netcat implementation in PowerShell. Um, and so we can listen on port 80 and then start some random process. And so now we see that consent.exe, which is that, uh, what was it called? The UNC, I think, or? C. Yeah, that, uh, that's the process that's associated with that. And so we see things like consent.exe, we see the process ID, parent process ID, session ID, time created, so on and so forth. So this would literally work with any type of uh, WMI class. In this case, we use the Win32 process start trace class. Um, one thing that Matt alluded to is that you have to kind of, when you're looking at intrinsic versus extrinsic events, uh, Win32 process start trace is extrinsic, meaning that as soon as a process is created, it's going to fire, fire the event. Um, Win32 process can be used intrinsically with the instance creation event, um, but it's, you have a polling interval, so you could make that one second, but you could also make it 100 seconds. Um, and so you have a chance that you might miss processes <coughs> being created. Um, the Win32 process class has significantly more information like the uh, executable path and the command line and things of that nature. So it's kind of a trade-off of which one you want to use. Do you want the one that's definitely going to fire, or do you want the one that's going to give you more fidelity on the data? And so maybe you might even use both. And so, in, in theory, there's more going on in the background, but Netcat or PowerCat only will capture one packet at a time. All right, what am I doing on time? I'm over. So. 
All right, we'll skip over this part. Uh, in general, uh, you can also enumerate WMI event subscriptions um, using WMI events. So you can do like get WMI event filter, get, get NT event log, event consumer, so on and so forth. It's pretty simple. Okay, so we also uh, created a registered permanent WMI event to where literally everything is done from one commandlet. And so um, if we show the help of this, again, tons of, tons of parameter sets, so you gotta kind of figure out how you wanna use it and what, uh, yeah, yeah, June, please help. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so what we're doing here is we're creating a, we're gonna be splatting again, so we have a name of my first subscription, event namespace roots mv2, query select star from instance creation event within one, where target instance is a 132 process, and then we're doing query language WQL. In this case, we're using a log file event consumer, so register permanent WMI event has access to use all different uh, event consumer types. And so we're going to write a file called temp test.log, and we're going to, uh, anytime a process is created, we're going to uh, write that target instance to that log. Does that automatically append? Yes. Yep. All right, so that's been, that's been created all in one fail swoop. Um, we can show that we have the event filter whoops, there. Uh, let's see. And we have the event consumer. Um, so now what I can do is start some random process called notepad, right? That's a good example. We'll leave that running for now because remember this is an intrinsic event so we need it to stay running for a bit. And then uh, hopefully this file has been created already but we're just gonna get content. And so here's the contents. There's been a few processes created, right? And so notepad.exe, scrcons.exe, which is an artifact of that active script event consumer running. So that scrcons.exe is going to actually execute that VB script in the um, active script event consumer, and it, it does some work to like batch up those active script event consumer hits. And then like wmiprvse.exe was running as well. And, and you could filter for those particular ones that you know are not a problem and are likely to be turned Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. You can build that into your Right. Yeah. And so that, that's, that's where you would want to like store off your filter so that you don't have to constantly remember how to type that entire thing. All right, so there's that. All right, one last thing before we're done is, uh, so when I'm deploying out, let's say 20 signatures at a time, I don't necessarily want to sit there and type out, you know, register permanent WMI event subscription, and then let me do this one, and let me do that one, and so on and so forth. So uh, we created this concept called uh, like signature file. And so what it is is it's literally like a custom object that's going to have a filter name, a consumer name, and a consumer type. Um, this is assuming that in the filters directory within the uproot module, you have a, a filter named ext process create method, and in the consumers uh, consumers directory in the uproot module, you have an nt process create method. So there's a little bit of overhead here. It's not just going to magically do it for you, um, but that subscription is already defined out. I think there's like 12 subscriptions, and all I have to do is say install uproot signature, sig file, event log, and this will, the sig files are in the signature directory in the uproot module, and so I can, uh, let's see, I have two basic and event logs, so there's like a dynamic parameter which will look up your sig files for you, and when you run that, fingers crossed, uh, well, let me clear out everything. Now you get to see, get WMI event consumer, and remove some instance. So this is how you would kill off the ones that you already have. I've done this a lot recently, if you can tell. All right, and then we're gonna rerun that install. Fingers crossed, okay. So now it all installed, it kind of looks like it didn't do anything, but we could do get WMI event filter, and there's 12-ish filters there, right? It's all just kind of magic. Uh, get WMI event subscription, and we see all the different subscriptions, so we can enumerate that. Um, and that is the end of my sure. presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I, I think it's lunchtime, so I'm willing to stay around and answer any questions that anybody has and get in more depth. Yeah, we'll take them offline. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.